this to allegedly? Well, looks like from what I can see here, his wife. Oh my my, that's awful. That's terrible. The stuff. victim is Patricia Masters. Uh, it was done in front of the children, allegedly. Um, doesn't say in the press release. Oh, because that was the original news story, so that must be news mistaken. Story. He's right up there. He's, he's he's in news radio up there, so he knows he's a news. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, Dan, this is an amazing day for us. It doesn't really change anything, does it? I mean, we knew the Supreme Court rarely hears such small cases as this. Isn't that correct? Well, they rarely hear a case that has no basis. I mean, you had your arbitration decision upheld on the facts by an Obama-appointed liberal San Francisco judge who had no reservation saying that you deserve to win. So, yeah. Well, he knew that obviously, and then he took it to the Ninth Circuit and the Liberal Court of the Ninth Circuit. As liberal as it gets, they upheld it, right? Upheld it strongly. Everybody was strongly in your favor. What bothers me is that, and this is what you brought up earlier. This was a five-year process, and you didn't even go into the full, gory details of what they put you through in order to win. Ninety-nine out of a hundred people taking on a big evil corporation like TRN would collapse financially. They couldn't do it. And emotionally. You, you held up, but, I mean, it wasn't easy, Michael. Well, I don't want to say you were there for me, but you were. And, I, you know, you're a lawyer, but you're also my friend. I also have a very strong family. And those bad nights that I woke up, how many people can say they called their lawyer at 3 in the morning and we had a conversation? I did. Look, here's the thing. You talked about the explosion when the other attorney had the, the case and, and they had some hearings. And you just had to vent on these people because the process was so unfair. Let me just tell you, listeners, what you went through. Just to get into a, a room with these arbitrators, you had to spend more money than, than would cost to buy a house in some neighborhoods. And then when the other side didn't pay their side of the money, the arbitrator said, well, then everything gets thrown out and you have no remedy. You'll have to pay the other side's money also. I mean, that's the kind of crazy process that's involved here. So People nobody don't understand do it. it. No, nobody. These are and I, Dan, you're an attorney. From the bottom of my heart, I would never ever recommend uh, arbitration again. Would you agree with that or not? I agree with it, and your listeners need to be warned because when you sign a contract for your cell phone or when you get internet service. Half the time, there's a provision that says you have to arbitrate everything. If you're a Kaiser member here in California, you have to arbitrate, which basically means you have to basically say, do whatever you want to do to me. I'm out of luck. Um, you know, it's not just the money. Isn't it interesting? Here you are, uh, you're a top criminal defense attorney, and you're arguing that the courts give a person a better shot at justice than arbitration. Isn't that what you're saying? Ever in letting, you know, letting judges or arbitrators decide things. I like jurors. What is a juror? A juror is, is, if I took 12 people who listen to the Savage Nation, I would put them on any case. I don't care if it's a liberal case, a conservative case. People are fundamentally fair. When you put one or two or three people who are professionals in charge, you get all sorts of motives, um, tilts in their brain thinking, you know, how do you become a lawyer? Why do you become a lawyer? You know, why don't you get make an honest living and work and produce something? <laughs> Stop it, Dan. Well, you, don't, you, don't, you don't have to genuflect in front of me just because you're a lawyer. Stop it. I won't permit you to do that. You don't need to do it. You work very hard, and I know the kind of cases that you take on. You, did you hear Michael Levine, DEA agent, on my show before? Yeah, I, I, I was. I was. I loved it. I, I wish. I wish you didn't put me on and put him on. He's so good. And I'll yeah. tell you something. Sean Penn is in trouble in Mexico. I talked to Marty Garbus, who's our great First Amendment lawyer and my cousin, and he said that Sean Penn has no worries in the U.S. But because um, he does have all the protections of a real reporter. But he says that in Mexico, you know, all holds, all you know, all rules are off. Any, they can do anything. So you know, Levine is totally right on that. Now you've represented some pretty tough characters, haven't you, Dan? As a I've defense attorney, the roughest characters um, around. Yes. So knowing the world that Michael Levine talked about from a different point of view, from the lawyer point of view, because you go in and out of. Some of the worst prisons in California, isn't that? I mean, that's true, isn't it? I meet I meet with people who are considered very scary. Okay, so you know the other side of the the the, the coin. Michael is a former DEA agent and an expert witness. You are an attorney who represents criminals. 
Knowing that world as well as you do, would you say that the actor is in any danger? I think so. I think that the actress who set up the deal is going to be looked at very carefully to see whether she lets somebody else know what's going on. Penn's just a a goofy, you know, kind of guy who who screwed up and got followed and thought he was so important. They're not going to bother with him, but they're looking carefully at her and who she's connected to in the Mexican police and government and what deal she made. She's at great risk. Mm. You know what I want to do, Dan? People don't get a chance to speak to people of your caliber. I'm going to open the lines up for a quick minute here on the Savage Nation at 855-407-282. We talked about court horror stories all, all, a little earlier. We have some amazing callers that have held for two hours. And then I'm going to give people an opportunity to call Dan Horowitz on the Savage Nation for a quick in and out. But before we, we do, I'm not going to go to break. Here's the number, guys, 855-407-282. But Susie on KLIF in Dallas has been holding for two hours to tell her story. Susie, fire away quickly. What's your court horror story? Well, I um, had kind of a very long ordeal. I know what you've been through. I can feel for you. I was stalked for five years and ended in a rape. Um, I ended up getting pregnant um, by some, I mean, that was just bizarre. And um, then the stalker wasn't done, came back and wanted custody. Um, Wait, uh, let me see if I can follow it. You, you were raped by a stalker. You became pregnant, and then the stalker wants custody of the baby? Well, share custody, because we're going to be tied together forever. Um, that's what he used to leave on my voice message uh, uh, when he was stalking me. You know, I want you to be the... <sighs> and of the weirdest things, that happened. I mean, how could that happen? And I just didn't... I just... Well, what, not, is this, well, what does this have to do with the courts, though? The court said he has right to the child? Absolutely. They don't care how, what, where, when, why. Um, he has paternal rights and has rights to access to the child. And it doesn't matter if the child's going to be used uh, emotionally and against you as, you know, to continue to stalk. Oh, wait, you're saying that the courts upheld the rapist's right to custody to your child? Yes. The only stop that is present, but they won't use it, is if. It, in the bottom line, it's supposed to be whatever is in the best interest of the child. But Well, I guess it's in the best interest of the child to have a rapist as a father. The, 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 the judges, because there's so much battles between mothers and fathers and men's and women's rights, they will not, they don't even care if it's a rapist. You can't find a judge, and I, you can call any of the major people Oof. that you know, are involved in this. Holy God. They'll no wonder you, and Susie, no wonder you held so long to tell that horrible tale. I hope you got it off your chest. It is now 47 minutes after the hour. The minute I come back, we go to the callers, to uh, the attorney extraordinaire, Dan Horowitz, right here on the Savage Nation. Our approach would preserve the right of Americans who have insurance to keep their doctor in their plan. It would reduce costs and premiums for millions of families and businesses. Our approach would bring down the deficit by as much as $1 trillion over the next two decades. Starting in 2011, we are prepared to freeze government spending for three years. Like any cash-strapped family, we will work within a budget to invest in what we need and sacrifice what we don't. And if I have to enforce this discipline by veto, well, anyway, again, the sound break is just part of the nature of the business. Uh, we have 140 unfulfilled Obama promises from past State of the Union addresses uh, put together by Grabian. They're worth listening to. He was going to cure cancer, freeze government spending, colonize outer space, uh, uh, going line by line through the budget, eliminating needless programs. He was going to convert sunlight into liquid fuel. He was going to close Gitmo. He was going to end the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. He will, well, you get the list. That was only in 2008. In 2009, the great leader, who some are comparing to Snow White, said that the stimulus bill would create 3.5 million jobs. It didn't. He, well, he said a lot of things. But then again, that's why he was elected the second time, because uh, the American uh, electorate is so intelligence, intelligent. He said it would use stimulus funds to build a high-speed railway in Florida. In fact, they were used to buy beachfront houses in Florida by the grifters who supported him. He would build a new generation of nuclear energy plants. He's not built one. He would pass a climate. You get the picture. He said, oh, he said in 2011 there'll be more nuclear power. 
more natural gas and more wind and solar. He said in 2011 he would secure America's borders during the State of the Union address. He said he would, enfor he would enforce existing immigration laws. Well, you get the picture. Do we have any more of the speeches? Because they're wonderful to hear. Maybe we'll play them tomorrow when the tape isn't broken. But then again, if you like Snow White, if you like Superman, if you like Pinocchio, if you like things of that nature, you're going to love the State of the Union address that occurs very shortly. I think the president is getting ready to uh, enter the auditorium. That should take a good 45 minutes to an hour. And... uh I'm not going to watch it. I can guarantee you I'm not going to watch it. I won't even take a nap. I don't want to know anything about what he says because it's all empty promises, all hollow and all shallow. But I want to say this. It's during these State of the Union addresses that I'm ashamed to be an American. I'm ashamed that we are stuck with a political system that is so not only outdated but so corrupt. And there is nothing more corrupt than watching the State of the Union address by any president. To watch these phony statements and to hear the applause and every minute... Another round of applause. And then Nancy Pelosi leaps up. Another round of applause. It's embarrassing. It's childish. We're worthy of something far better than what we have. And that's why I'm not going to watch any of it. It's been an amazing day on The Savage Nation. One of my best shows to date. Interviewing Michael Levine, former DEA agent. I hope you enjoyed it. God bless America. Savage.